Okay, very good morning. It is Monday the 8th of March and happy International Women's Day to any of our female followers in our community. And also as well, we're just around 26 subscribers away from our next meaningful uh, milestone on YouTube, which is 20,000 subscribers. So hit that subscribe button, help us get over the line, take us to 20K, it'll be much appreciated. Uh, just quite amazing really how that community has grown and, and long may it continue. We really love uh, delivering the content that we do on the channel. So yeah, it'd be great if we could get to, to that 20K level. Uh, but look, the briefing for this morning, normal rules apply. I'm gonna update you a little bit about some of the major weekend news flow. We're also gonna have a look at what's in store for the week ahead. There's definitely some interesting things to talk about here at the open, uh, which I'll go into from the oil market. Um, to also the US 10 year, the continued focus on yields. Uh, and then as I said, some interesting things this week with the likes of the ECB policy meeting as well. So look, let's get straight into things and look at the cross asset class mix this morning. And the dollar is firmer once again, albeit relatively marginal. It's about 0.14%, but it is exerting some um, initial downside weight in both these major currency pairs here. Looking at euro dollar first, uh, we did go through 119 uh, very early in European trade, uh, and you can see now that providing a bit of a degree of near term resistance having broken through on the failed break that we saw during some of the uh, initial payroll dollar fluctuation on Friday. So worth keeping an eye here because last week we closed beneath the technically important area. Uh, which was that one 60 level, which was the previous low that we had at the beginning of February. And then we are at the moment trading at our lowest levels in the euro since going back to late November. But here you can see is quite a key level test already being seen um, at 118.89. And you can see that encapsulates some of those relative highs that we were seeing in set October of 2020. Really was um, restricting some of the upside price action until we broke out of that in late November. So any breakdown of here in price, the next clearer target is quite some way off technically. Uh, looking on the higher time frame on the daily chart here would be around the 118 handle or 04 and a half as I've got marked, which is that low that we had on the 23rd of November. So this all coming, of course, as we continue to see generally higher yields this morning, stock rotation, so tech stocks weak overnight in Asia, uh, a continuation of that play of the higher yield environment, and that has been more favorable for the dollar for the time being, which might put further downside weight on that euro currency pair. Um, likewise, then, if you were looking at cable, it's a similar type of story, so it's definitely the greenback in focus rather than anything sterling specific. And was just looking here on a 60 minute chart of cable. Uh, and we've obviously seen quite a, a decent pullback over the last two weeks or so in sterling. And quite an interesting range to, to keep an eye on here in some of the near term price action in the intraday uh, market. We've already had um, resistance found at the pivot level very early as Europe's come back in. But really for the session and near term price action, I'd be keeping an eye at these two areas, which was that uh, momentary low that we had around payrolls, again with dollar movement that we saw. Uh, and then that brings in that low that we were trading going back to the 12th of February. You've also got the S1 residing just below there. So 137.76 in the future is the lower level of that, that current range that we're in. And then on the upside, 138.63. Uh, which was the highs that we were seeing on Friday, back on the 2nd, and then um, also back in early and mid-February as well. So cable, I'd be quite interested to see uh, how we perform around these levels. Any breakdown on the downside then, uh, it's this kind of area here, uh, which was the, uh, the resistance kind of range high that we were trading during um, late January, early February, that would be a, a key area of downside support for the week as a whole to keep an eye on. That would be around 137.50 uh, should we get down uh, that low at any point. Okay. Um, otherwise, elsewhere, uh, gold has had a little bit of a bounce overnight, but it's failed to sustain that amid generally the dollar strength and dollar strength higher yield, this, this environment that we've been used to seeing the last two weeks. We're seeing moderate signs of that restarting again this morning. 
and with a light calendar it could well be that those trends really um, are the most definitive factor of the session ahead without any kind of scheduled um, economic kind of releases due for today so the dollar picking up a little bit as Europe's come in has just reversed that overnight bid in gold and moving back down again uh, through 1700 so on the downside obviously we're we'll keeping an eye at these lower levels which we we flirted with last week which was around that 1683 level having on the dailies broken down significantly last week in a continuation of that ongoing trend otherwise in the equity indices yeah it's quite clearly evident already at the moment that the nasdaq is an underperformer and that was the case overnight in the asia pacific session china and hong kong led the regional retreat tech stocks were the hardest hit and just looking here on the nasdaq it's just touching session lows as i speak and i want to flip it on the daily and just want to have a look at a couple of different things here so this chart that i'm sharing here now uh, encapsulates the entire pandemic picture so the onset of the pandemic, the, the March route that we had in 2020, the phenomenal recovery that we've had up to these all-time highs that were printed um, only back on the 16th of Feb, which was up at, um, at these levels at 13,900. So we've pulled back and um, this morning we're trading a little heavy again. The Nasdaq 100 futures are already down close to 200 points this morning. Uh, we did see an about turn on Friday. Um, after equity markets had a little bit of an indecisive reaction to payrolls eventually moving higher um, but we've, we're reversing a lot of that at, at this present point in time so here then what I've just marked up are a couple of rectangles that Friday low um, down at 12 to 34 I think is quite key any breakdown of that would then be looking to eye up the uh, kind of mid-November late November area which was around here which was uh, 12,086 Anything below there would then be that same time period on the low end of that range at 11,808. And then below there um, would be down here at 11,500, basically. The bigger move, of course, would be if we did get down to around these sort of levels at 11,000. And what percentage-wise, what would that be? So from current price down to those, those lows, that would be about a 12% move down to around that 11,500 would be about a 7.5% move from where we are at the moment. I guess the point I wanted to make is, and the reason why I'm talking about these downside levels, is even if we got down that far, um, looking at where we were pre-pandemic, we were here. We were down sub, obviously, 10,000. So when we start talking about pullback to 11,000 being a really deep move, it doesn't seem that deep when you look at it in context then of where we were. So that being said, I do think this NASDAQ is susceptible for some further downside in these current conditions at the moment, which seemingly don't seem to be going away. And I think that rotational play will likely be ongoing for the time period ahead. And if that is the case, then as we take out some of these key levels, there could be some days when we continue to see this, this underperformance in the NASDAQ. Um, and technically speaking, you could see some quite quick runs in price action lower down uh, before you start to be met with some strong dip buying then, uh, which which will happen at, uh, at one point, because I think at the moment the market is in a readjustment mode for this new yield environment. That doesn't detract from the point that in the end, I do still think that with um, policy remaining low, and with fiscal stimulus coming, there might be a rotational effect. But generally, I think once we get lower down, it's a positive narrative for equities all round. It's just that valuations are quite high and particularly punchy on the tech space, uh, which have got to be um, shifted from you know, potentially in, into value from growth at this point. Um, all right. Oil is the, the, the one I want to kick off with then. This is just a quick look at WCI crude. We gapped up overnight. We briefly ran up in the front month futures up to 68 bucks. And if you look on the daily, this is going back all the way to 2018 when we initially hit a peak just over 75 bucks. And as you can see, we've got over the April 2019 high now. So we're now, now trading at the highest levels in crude that we have done since going back to kind of Q3, Q4 of 2018. Uh, next stop, you got to think is 70 bucks now psychologically on the upside. And why have we 
continued this this move up. I mean, underpinned, of course, by uh, the rollovers from from Saudi, predominantly the decision to to not move um, on that 1.5 million. A little bit of a, uh, a gimme to the Russians and Kazakhstan to just get them to agree to that. Uh, but overall, that helped oil prices last week. Comes in the context of that improving uh, kind of growth perspective in the in the period ahead with stimulus and vaccination improvements and so on and so forth. And now you've got continued renewed tensions in a very sensitive geographic region. And that takes us into our first story then, which is um, Yemen's Houthi forces on Sunday fired drones and missiles at a Saudi Aramco oil company facility in Ras Tanura and military targets in the Saudi cities of uh, Damam, Asur and Jassan, according to Iran's aligned group's military spokesman. Um, now, if I flip over to here, this is a look at the, the Ras Tanura terminal. Uh, it's the world's largest oil export port, so it's particularly important. Um, and then therefore potentially for causing supply shocks in the immediacy in the, the, the price of WTI that we trade. Um, here then, the export facility is the so-called Sea Island. It's actually three interconnected offshore platforms, as you can see, uh, where super tankers dock. And there are two large oil tank farms, which you can see here on, on this kind of uh, this backside here of this island um, outpost, if you like, with the north and south piers. Now, I think an important thing that's that's happened here is the tensions here have been ongoing for a while, actually. Um, more recently, on March 4th, Saudi Arabia was subject to several missile attacks with Houthis claiming that they'd managed to hit Aramco oil facilities in Jeddah. And so this doesn't come as a, a new thing, but the frequency of these attacks is definitely rising, even if the impact on energy infrastructure appears limited, uh, which is the case actually from the weekend. Um, the capacity though is cause for serious damage does exist. And so uh, you know, what basically people are looking at is that the boost to risk premium for oil has got to increase given that there's always the risk of a significant disruption. Uh, and as I said, given that this is the world's biggest offshore oil loading facility. So definitely one to watch. Um, these things tend to kind of pick up in this way because then it, it's met with ag aggressive kind of posturing politically as any potential responses. And so this is definitely one to watch as we go through the rest of the um, rest of the week but in in the picture of everything else that's going on um, at the moment from OPEC supply deal to the general growth outlook uh, in the pandemic recovery and now you sprinkle in um, some geopolitical unrest in this highly sensitive area it's kind of the perfect cocktail for for potential upside in oil at the moment um, and so yeah 70 bucks um, still remain quite bullish there that that will be achieved at some point in the near future uh, moving on then, in the Senate, we had over the weekend, uh, the $1.9 trillion plan was approved in the Senate on Saturday. And this means then that the House is scheduled to vote on Tuesday on the Senate's version, which then must happen and approved before then it goes to Biden for being signed in for signature into law. Uh, Democrats are seeking to enact the legislation before unemployment benefits expire on the 14th of March. Uh, the 14th of March being this week on Sunday. So time off the essence there. Uh, from a Federal Reserve point of view, worth noting that this week as we go into the, um, the coming sessions that the Fed go into their blackout period because we do have the f uh, next week, the mid-March FOMC next meeting. And so there will be no speeches then from uh, Fed officials. So interesting then that the recent comments that we have had from Powell multiple times, but from also from his colleagues, which is no real explicit comment to try and push back against the whole yield uh, increase that we've had of late. There's there's no other opportunity now into the blackout period for them to comment on that. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't get source comments come out from the likes of Bloomberg or the Wall Street Journal and so forth if this yield movement was continued to be um, particularly impactful on markets. That doesn't go to say that they, they can't find a way backdoor to communicate. So something to be aware of. 
Um, the ECB then is, is quite a big thing um, this week and it isn't so much actually the ECB meeting on Thursday, which although will be looked at, um, we're not expecting a great deal from the policy meeting in itself. Christine Lagarde, of course, is going to be asked about this recent rise in yields and its impact uh, on just general um, financial conditions uh, and whether or not what would be the threshold for them to respond to anything of that nature. Um, so her skills on the presser are definitely going to be put to the test. The other thing is um, analysts at ING note for the ECB itself, they're expecting a modest downward revision to the 2021 GDP growth forecast and the upward revision to CPI forecasts, but neither of which that they're anticipating to make too much of an impact on the euro. Uh, downgrading growth, I think, has comes as absolutely no surprise, just given the uh, relative slow uh, vaccination program rollout that we're observing in Europe and so consequently uh, a more protracted longer lockdown and slower reopening so uh, downward revisions become more pessimistic on growth but more um, kind of more bullish on inflation uh, again very much expected just given the continued uh, resurgence in energy prices uh, and, and and that's going to really lift things on that side of uh, of the projections so what is it that we're looking for? Well, actually, it's today. Um, today is a particularly quiet calendar um, for global markets. However, as you will see from here, one of the main things that's highlighted is the ECB PEP. So the ECB weekly update on their pandemic emergency purchase program. And data on the bank's purchases due today will cover the week through March 5th. And this has drawn considerable attention if you are reading any of the press over the weekend. And given the movement we've had in yields over the period of which this data would have measured, um, although I, I don't see a huge surprise on the back of it today, I think you certainly need to keep an eye out for it because it's more than likely that there will be a temporary increase in the pace of purchases that the ECB were doing um, in order to uh, counteract some of the sharp yield rise that we've been observing of late. Um, analysts expect the ECB to step up the pace of its bond purchases in that week uh, after they fell to 12 billion euros in the final week of February, down from more than 17 billion um, the year or the week earlier. Uh, these are these numbers are important because it's going to give you a reference point for when that announcement comes out later on this afternoon. I think it's around 2:45 p.m. London uh, as to what to look for. Uh, as a reference, then the ECB watcher at Pictet Dusukret. Um, Ducrezet says he sees a number above 20 billion um, as, a, as, a, as a number to base then any subsequent reaction around. Um, so yeah, that, that, that will be quite key today for, for Euro and Euro is on the back foot at the moment. Uh, and generally speaking, what we're seeing across asset classes this morning, just to reiterate with a quiet calendar ahead, it gen tends to draw focus back to the predominant top level themes. And that is continuation of higher yields, firmer dollar, so equities weaker, T-notes lower, gold lower, currency pairs down. Uh, and then uh, as a side point almost separately to this in its own dynamic, oil is, is generally quite elevated at the moment, but upside could well be capped by if we get further um, strong increases in the, in the dollar. Then the other thing then is over the weekend, just to be aware of China, February exports posted a record surge from COVID-19 depressed levels. But that in its sense does discount then, I think, the fact that in dollar terms, exports were up 155% in February compared to a year earlier. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. Um, it did provide a little bit of a positive start to Chinese trade. However, generally sentiment there deteriorated as the, as the, as the overnight uh, session went on. And then the final thing I wanted to have a quick comment on was was COVID nineteen on a global level and really looking at the US, UK, and European situation. So here, looking at daily new confirmed COVID nineteen cases per million, and as you can see, Italy continues to be heading in the in the wrong direction at the moment. Um, quite a rapid acceleration and and by far the highest level of COVID rates that we've seen. Uh, since the year got underway. France remains kind of doggedly high um, without really going anywhere in, in terms of the downside. And obviously this has come after they made that choice a few weeks ago about not going into a full national lockdown. Uh, and then Germany as well has been seeing um, levels 
not just plateauing, but very marginally increasing. And this, of course, goes to the opposite of the UK. Um, case rates, thankfully, continue to head south, as to is the same case in the US, albeit at a slightly slower fashion. Uh, and then overlaid that with the current vaccination situation, things are improving in Europe. They're starting to pick up and heading in the right direction, How, albeit there's still quite a significant divergence between what it looks like in the rate of uh, administering these these vaccines compared to the UK and the US. Interestingly, in the UK, things have slowed a little bit um, after that real key government push and acceleration that we had to hit that mid-February target. Since hitting that target, things have actually, when we hit the target, we were basically peaked. And since then, it has dropped off a little bit. And the US has now superseded the UK uh, in terms of um, doses administered per 100 people. An interesting thing that one of our guys on Amplify Live was looking at this morning was um, looking at the latest figures on vaccine hesitancy um, rates. And you can see here the UK has probably the least amount of hesitancy and also obviously a very high amount of, uh, of adults who have already been vaccinated. So we're up here at 85%. Um, the point being here is that somewhere like in the US, it's more like 50-50. Uh, in France, even lower at 47. Um, and there was kind of three things to watch that one of our guys was giving us a, a kind of briefing on this morning very early. And that was one, premature opening up of certain predominantly Republican states. And the reason why he's brought that to our attention is that as we looked at some of those case rates, um, particularly COVID declining in the US, as we've seen here, and now with the rate of, uh, of drug vaccination program rollout being at its fastest pace it has been and expected to continue in that direction, particularly given the recent uh, coordinated uh, manufacturing deal between Merck and J&J &J as well, with some of the latter drugs still to come online. So premature opening up in certain predominantly Republican states could be something to look out for. Remember in America, it's not a nationwide blanket coordinated strategy. It's very much fractured onto a federal and state level. So there will be di differences within the nation in itself. Two, the reluctance of younger groups to take up the, uh, the vaccine. Uh, I guess generally uh, as well, uh, transmission rates between those uh, where mobility is, is very high. Then in three, the spread of escape COVID strains like the Brazilian P1 that may have ability to overwhelm already acquired immunity. So kind of three factors there to, to have a look at. So markets definitely looking generally through that at the moment, but they're still potentially uh, a bumpy road ahead was the point uh, that our guy was making. Um, so the main thing being that that's US specific and the reason why the UK doesn't fall so much into that, that categorization is the fact that most UK people um, do have in mind they want to be vaccinated. Um, one of the most highest in the, the entire planet at the moment with all nations being measured. All right, a quick look at the, the calendar then for, for the rest of this week. There's a few things to be aware of. So Monday, very quiet, looking out for the ECB PEP announcement later on this afternoon. Tuesday, then you get Eurozone uh, GDP and employment numbers, but these are final Q4 readings, so shouldn't be too much uh, of a market mover, if any at all. You do have the German trade balance first thing at the European Open on Tuesday. Wednesday then, things start to get a little bit more interesting, definitely for the US, and I can incorporate then that with Friday with the US, where you do get PPI and also University of Michigan sentiment, the March preliminary figure. So last week, the five-year break-even rate in the US hit 2.5%, hit and that was the first time since 2008. And with US yields climbing at the moment, um, it has led to the fact that expectations for the year on year um, US CPI has actually risen now to 1.7%. Uh, although the Fed have made clear that they're willing to look through this kind of temporary uh, push in inflation in the short term, uh, markets are definitely sensitive to inflation metrics uh, in, in the context of, uh, of movement. So I definitely would be keeping an eye out for that. I don't think ultimately it's going to move the Fed's hand, but uh, it could well provide a catalyst for subsequent price movement when we get to Wednesday session. 
Um, the other things then is, is jobs claims usually on Thursday, uh, Michigan on Friday alongside PPI. Uh, so Michigan expectations of a slight month to month improvement given the declining COVID case rates and, the, uh, and speeding up the vaccination rollout in America. Uh, and then you've got the ECB on Thursday, of course, which concludes really the, the main order of play with UK GDP also coming out on Friday morning. Uh, and that is it. So uh, quite a lot to digest there. Um, remember to check out Amplify Live and the community. Sam did share his technical look ahead across the trade setups on Sunday, uh, as he will normally be doing now going forward. Um, so it's definitely worth having a look at that as well. All right, guys, have a good week ahead. And uh, any questions, just let me know in the Discord room. Thanks very much.